I need to know everything Who and the what and the where I need everything Trust me, I hear what you're saying But act like it's new what you're telling me I'm curious, George, I hop in the Porsche with five and a horse, I'm ready for war I'm coming for throws to turn to a ghost I need to know everything Now you be surprised at the info you get Is by letting them talk, so I'm letting them talk Gotta keep quiet, maneuver in science Then let them in talk up their body Another one body, that's just how it go I got some food. So, just left Harris with Tristan um, And there was a defect with the watch <laughs> And apparently from... The thousands, literally thousands of watches that, you know, my, my guy had a Rolex, a point of reference. Of the thousands of watches that he sold over the past decade that he's worked there, this is the only <laughs> defect they've ever had. So that's promising. So basically, yeah, they just have to get a replacement for it. Um, yeah, a bit odd, but like, then again, you know, I'd rather that it happens now than like, uh, you know, me leaving with the watch and then it has an error with it and then it looks like it's my fault or whatever. Plus, I mean, like, it's, you know, you're dealing with Rolex, like, their customer support is, yeah, top notch. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm gonna have to wait a little longer for the Platinum Daytona. So, ladies and gentlemen, here we are three days later after I paid for the Platinum Daytona. Obviously, there was basically there was some weird mix up. Uh, as I said, my point of reference at Rolex said that in the eight years that he's worked there, you know, sold thousands of watches. Uh, nothing like this has ever, uh, ever happened before. Basically, it's the just the final link that kind of folds over. So you have like the micro adjustment. There was something just a little off with it. So they had to get a replacement piece, but thankfully it took less than 24 hours so next day i picked up the watch i'm not gonna lie i've worn this a couple times and just haven't had time to get around to recording so yeah let's go ahead and unbox it obviously the platinum daytona coming in at 60,000 pounds there are different boxes that you get with rolex there's like just the regular ones you get with like your steel pieces you get a slightly bigger one with gold pieces and then this is sort of the largest box that they do i'm gonna be honest just in general rolex is um, I would say by far the worst when it comes to packaging. You know, this is a 60,000 pound watch. If you compare this to uh, Patek Philippe, if you compare this to obviously Richard Mille is like on a just totally different level. Yeah, Richard Mille definitely has the best packaging in my opinion. So they're mo number one when it comes to the box and also just everything you get with it. They give you branded Richard Mille headphones and just like they throw in so much stuff in there. It's super cool. But um, after that, I'd say it's 100% Patek Philippe. Then uh, Audemars Piguet, um, Jaeger Lecout, um, Vacheron, some of these other brands, I'm actually not entirely sure where their boxes are, but like Rolex really lags behind. And, and honestly, with more expensive pieces like this, I would have loved if they'd just done something special. Like even with that, um, even with AP, sometimes they'll have their watches on little watch winders, like within the box. It's, I don't know, I just, maybe it's also just because I've opened so many Rolex boxes by this point. I know for some people this looks like super premium, but like, honestly guys, this is pretty cheap. So this is what the inside looks like. There's this little flap right here. And this just has my warranty card, some paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thing with this box is basically, you can make it into like a little jewelry box. As you can see, you open that flap open right here. Here, I've just got one of the swing tags and the pricing. So this watch costs 6,650 pounds. You can see right here, one extra link. And apart from that, the main star of the show is this right here. This right here is the Platinum Daytona. So I already love this watch more than I thought I would. And I think, and as it currently stands, I'd say this is probably my favorite piece in my collection. Now, Platinum is, I think, about twice as heavy as a gold pieces. So if you think about like steel and you compare that to like a rose gold piece and then you compare that to like a platinum piece guys this is honestly genuinely very heavy and i remember the first time i ever uh, wore a platinum or tried on platinum uh, i was like yeah there's there's no chance in hell i will ever own a platinum piece like this is uncomfortable weirdly enough now i find it actually pretty comfortable um i have quite large wrists and you know it, it doesn't really feel like an issue but this watch right here really is one of those if you know you know watches and it's just one of those uh, you know understated watches there's a lot of stuff in my collection that I know I just won't be wearing when I'm 40 or 50, to be honest. When I'm, I'd say probably even in my early 30s, I probably just get to a point where like, I don't want any rose gold pieces. Like I just want to be super tame. And I will just say in general, I do actually like rose gold. And I guess it also depends on your skin tone. Uh, rose gold works well with my skin tone. But I guess my point is, 
I don't know at the age of 45 whether I'll be wearing my rose gold Royal Oak Turbion or, or my Richard Mille RM30 with a baby blue strap, you know what I mean? Whereas this is just such a classic timeless watch. As I said, for most people, and even me, 18 months ago, I would not know that this is platinum. Like I would have just thought, oh, okay, cool, it's a, it's a steel watch. The, and you know, the retail price difference between this and a steel is, you know, the steel is around, I think, 10 and a half grand. This is 60 and a half grand. Grant, granted, the steel literally goes for like double its retail uh, in the market. And this right now is sitting about same in the market as it is retail. You know, this is not really one of those flipper watches. But yeah, as I said, just this ice blue dial is, is beautiful. It's <clears throat> the entire thing is mesmerizing, even in terms of the bezel. Um, initially, if you look on the website, it can look like this quite garish sort of brown. But in person, it almost looks like black in a lot of lighting. And then sometimes, you know, you'll realize, OK, this is brown. So, and, you know, what can I say? It's a Daytona, as you guys know, like Daytona is one of the most timeless, classic, uh, classy watches. And then to have a watch of that caliber and and to do it in platinum is, as I said, it's one of those if you know, you know, watches. And it's one of those like, you know, you see someone with a platinum Daytona and you're like, yeah, you're moving different. And I think I've told you guys this funny story before. Last year, I was on a date with this girl and, um, you know, I was wearing a respectable watch uh, back then. I was wearing my uh, rose gold Royal Oak. Obviously, now I have the Turbion. Back then, it was just, you know, the regular no complication or anything like that. You know, solid piece, market value around 40, 45,000 pounds. You know, respectable. Anyways, this girl comes in wearing a platinum Daytona. And I was just blown away. Whoa. I mean, when a girl wears a Daytona full stop, it's super attractive just because it's like, this girl knows a thing or two about watches. And I don't know, there's just something about a woman with a Daytona. It's just like, you know, I just don't think you can beat it. But then for her to be wearing platinum, like... <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I felt a little demasculated for a second. And uh, the other crazy thing, as I said, for me, like, I wear this and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, I know this is a heavy watch, but like, I don't mind. For a girl to wear this watch, like, I don't know how her left shoulder wasn't just like blown up to like bodybuilder size and then her right side was just normal. So yeah, ever since then, that was kind of like the first time I properly looked at the Platinum Daytona because I'm not going to lie, like I spent more time looking at that watch on the date than I did the girl. I mean, hey, they were both works of art, but I was definitely quite drawn in by that, uh, by that ice blue dial. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is the new addition to the watch collection. This is one of those pieces that, I mean, I've told you guys this before, anything I get at retail for me, and I'll touch on this briefly because we're about to hop into a watch specific Q&A, but like any watch I get at retail, I'm never going to sell because I am a genuine collector. I've got watch books on all four floors of my house. I want the expensive pieces. I want the cheap pieces. I want, if I'm looking at older watches or vintage watches, I care if it's a A serial or a B serial Royal Oak. You know, I've really started to build up my collection and, and I see myself having a 100, 200 watch collection. Now, obviously, you know, for me, what I love about watches is you can just stick them in the safety deposit box, which which 90% of my collection is always in and there's no running cost to them. They can just sit there and they're a great asset and a great investment. So as I said, this is a watch where like I never see myself getting rid of it, unlike some of the other pieces that I've got an at market value. So I'm not afraid to you know then shift them if the price is right or, you know, I just don't have a connection with that watch anymore. So yeah, I'm definitely very, very, very happy with this watch. I'd say right now, this is probably my favorite watch that I own, actually. So ladies and gents, to end things off, I'm going to go ahead and do a watch specific q and I asked on my Instagram, which if you're not following me, I'll get Tristan to leave that on the screen now. And I just picked out a couple questions. So we'll start off with thoughts on footballers and rappers icing out uh, rare and prestigious watches. I am 100% against icing out watches. Now, I say against, I would advise against it. You do whatever you want. You know, if you want to waste your money, you know, fine by me. But genuinely, I think if you're going to get some ice on your watches, get a factory ice. And honestly, I'm not opposed to that. At some point in my life, I want a rainbow Daytona and that's factory ice. Even some of the, there's a Rolex GMT with like, blue sapphires and, and, a, and a bit of ice, I believe like that one's really cool as well. You know, far, far down the line, I definitely get uh, a Nautilus factory ice. There's even some Nautiluses with like really cool, like blue baguette bezels and stuff like that. Anything that's factory, I'm not against because you're still retaining some of the value of that watch. Here's the issue. It's when you take a watch that's iced, you know, let's say, for example, you see this a lot with Nautiluses, people will spend, you know, to get a steel Nautilus, you're going to have to spend 50,000 pounds and then you're going to have to spend another 15,000 pounds to then ice it out. So you're in for 65. And once you ice it, it's actually the value actually goes down, not up. So, you know, then the uh, watch might be worth, you know, between 42 and 45,000. 
So it's just such a dumb financial investment, honestly, guys. I'm not against ice or diamonds or whatever. I just think if you're gonna do it, do a factory. It's gonna be done better and you're gonna retain the value of the watch. Next question is, is it really worth buying so many watches? Genuinely curious. Well, well, there's two things that I wanna address with this question. First things first is, guys, there are collectors for everything. There's people that collect uh, guns. There's people that collect uh, baseball cards. There's, pe there's people that collect handbags. There's, you know, there's literally people that co collect coins. Like th there's collectors of everything. You know what I mean? And I think when you're a collector, you're just passionate about something. You're infatuated and like it's your heart's calling. For me, ever since I got off my first Timex expedition when I was eight years old, I had an interest in watches. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think someone that, for example, or you, you see sneakerheads as an, another example, like if you're a sneakerhead, like you just love it. So does it make sense to have 40 pairs of uh, Jordans? Probably not, but you love it. And at the end of the day, especially if you work hard, you need some sort of outlet. So that's number one. Now, if I was collecting in something that didn't really retain value, especially after I use it, like for example, sneakers, obviously sneakers retain value, but obviously once you give it a lot of wear and tear, they're really hard to restore. Like. If I was a sneakerhead and I had, you know, a, a really big sneaker collection, I would be tentative to obviously wear the sneakers because I don't want to devalue my collection. That is not the case with watches. With watches, you can wear it, you can throw them around, you can get scratches because then they, when you go to sell them, they're always going to be polished or at least the watch dealers that I work with. So, you know, if it's steel, you can basically polish steel about as many times as you want. If it's gold after the second time, it, you know, it is going to lose some of its sharpness. I actually don't really know about platinum, but long story short, I don't baby my watches in the slightest. Like, like I genuinely don't care about getting scratches on them, this or that. I don't baby them for me. A watch has a heart and a watch is there to be worn. So I wear my watches. And as I said, I don't worry about the value of it because I know that no matter what scratch or unless you really mess the watch up, but I'm, but I'm just talking cosmetic stuff. When it goes time to sell it, it's going to get polished anyways. So all those imperfections are, are going to be gone by the time that you time that the new buyer has it. And also you need to understand that like, Guys, polishing, genuinely, when you get a watch back from polishing or a polisher has done its thing, it genuinely looks brand new. Like, you could not tell ever. You genuinely could never tell that it was worn before. So, so basically what I'm trying to say here is obviously I have a lot of budget assigned to my watches. You know, for me, like really there is no budget depending on the watch. For me, you know, the way that I look at things is it's all dependent on how much will I lose when I go to sell it. If I was to t if I was to take all the watches I've gotten in the last 18 months and I was just to sell all of them right now, I would pocket probably around 100 grand. Now, granted, a lot of those pieces I got at retail. So it's like, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't really want to include that there. But if if I was to take all the watches that I bought at market value, aka I had to pay the, you know, the actual market price, I didn't buy it direct from the brand. Now they were brand new watches, but I went to, you know, watch club or bloom bar watches or you know, any of the quote unquote gray market, which I really don't like that term. But um, any of those dealers, as I said, I paid market price for it. If I was just to take that skew of it, I'd still make around 30 grand. So I can understand people thinking like, you know, why do you need that many watches? For me, it's like, why not? For me, it's a great store of value. It's something I get to actually use and enjoy. Unlike, for example, vintage cars. Obviously, if you have a vintage car, you don't want to run up the miles on it. You know, whereas a vintage watch or a modern watch, you know, watches in general, it's fine. You can give them the wear and tear. As I said, especially these modern watches. And then when it comes time to sell, it's not an issue because all of it will be handled when you go to sell the watch. So I guess, so as I said, for me, if this was a hobby where, you know, I'm bleeding money, my budget for watches would not be what it is. But it's, the, but it's simply the fact that I not only retain value in my watches, I actually make a decent side income. Now it's not like anything that I plan, but it just so happens to be that way from my watches. I can give you an example. The two watches that I've sold this year, my rose gold Royal Oak that I bought last year for 31 and a half K. I sold that this year for 42 K. And then I actually bought a 5711R rose gold Nautilus. I bought that, bought that for 76 and a half thousand pounds, brand new box papers, you know, literally from the day before. I bought that September 1st and then sold it mid October for 82 and a half thousand pounds. So I looked at that watch and I was like, this watch is going to climb up to the mid 80s, which is basically what it did. So I basically got to wear a hundred thousand dollar watch for four weeks and then make money on it. But as I said, that's why I look at watches the way I do. For me, the ones I buy at retail, it's definitely a calculated decision. My philosophy with watches is I will not buy a watch if I take a hit on it when I sell it. Like that's that is just my rule. Whether I'm buying retail or market value, that's just my rule. And knowing that I give myself free reign to buy whatever I want within reason. Also, last year or so I've been sitting cash heavy. Now going into 2021, there's 
quite a lot of investments that I'm making actually as we speak. So now obviously I need I need to siphon off funds for that. Prior to that, I was seeing cash heavy. So I said, rather than just like having the cash sit there, do nothing, I would rather put it to good use and, you know, just indulge in a hobby. Next question is, if you could keep only one watch for the rest of your life, I would either go for a steel Daytona. Definitely wouldn't go platinum just because it's it's just too heavy to be your daily beater. So either a steel Daytona or I say it now, but I don't know if, you know, I'd have the same answer in 15 years, but a rose gold Nautilus. I know that the obvious decision would be a steel Nautilus, but like I just I've owned that watch. Actually, technically, I still own that watch. I'm in the process of selling it at the moment. And yeah, I just never formed a connection with it. Barely wore that watch. I just think it's a bit janky. Whereas the 5711R, the rose gold version is just literally perfection. So yeah, I'd say those two watches. Next question is ever considered pivoting to watch your niche for SMA? If so, best outreach method? Yeah, 100%. Last year, I was literally on the cusp of pivoting my entire agency to work with gray market dealers, as I said. Now, last minute, I decided not to do it just because I've you know, spent so many years building up our, our reputation and name primarily within the info product space, as well as some really heavy hitting case studies with e-com businesses. So basically, my heart kind of got the best of me last year when I was thinking about this, uh, and I decided look, there's no point in throwing away everything you've worked for because it is basically like starting fresh. So I decided not to do it, but I think it is an amazing niche and one that people really aren't tapping into enough. Next question is, please explain how value of these watches appreciate. So there's two ways really. Um, well, first things first, like, as I said, there's retail and then there's market value. I have a very good relationship with Rolex where I've gotten, you know, a lot of the pieces that I've wanted. And also I've brought them a lot of clients. Funnily enough, a lot of my clients at the agency I've had four agency clients that have bought watches from Rolex and my point of reference there. And I, you know, I, I send them a lot of referrals actually of, of not people who are coming in to ask for a Pepsi or this or that, like people who are actually buying real watches, you know, people who are buying the rose gold pieces, the platinum pieces, et cetera, et cetera. We make our clients pretty good money at the agency and, you know, and, you know, I'm always banging on about watches. So that ends up bleeding through to the clients. And, and as I said, we've had quite a few clients actually then go on to buy. So yeah, that's retail. That's, you know, you're buying at the retail price. Now you could buy at the retail price, you know, let's say 10 grand. For example, a Daytona, you could buy a Daytona for 10 grand and the market value is 20 grand, literally double list. Um, or you could buy a watch for 10 grand and the market value is like six and a half. So that's technically one way that people can make money from watches if they get harder to get pieces and they end up flipping them. Obviously you make some money that way. As I said, that doesn't really interest me because I know that anytime that I'm buying a piece at retail, for example, a Pepsi or a rose gold day date, or, you know, one of these pieces from Rolex directly, I'm buying it at the cheapest price I could ever get it at. And I know that if I was to ever sell it, I would just want it back at a later date and then I'd have to pay market value for it again. So selling watches that I get at retail that I'm, you know, I'm not really involved in that, but obviously it is good to know that like if worst case scenario, which I don't ever intend on anything coming close to that, but like, it's good to know that I still have that store of wealth there and that, and that all the pieces I got at retail, which is that I have no intention of selling ever, but literally I'm talking, everything goes to shit. There's some big catastrophe, like just, you know, unforeseen events. There is a big store of wealth there that I would have made a lot of money on as well. So, so that's one side of things, but as I said, that just sits idle because that's just part of my long-term collection. There's the other side of it where I'm looking at pieces in the market and I'm going, ah, I think this is undervalued. And I think that I could get this piece, wear it, and then actually make money when I go to sell it. For example, like that rose gold Nautilus. That was literally my full intention going into it. So yeah, those are two ways. And the last final way is just getting a watch and just holding on to it for a very extensive amount of time. You know, the watch game has changed a lot over the last few years. And I think that it's only going to get bigger because rather than people investing in art or fine wines or vintage cars, I think a lot of uh, people who aren't even into watches are looking at watches as like a great store of wealth. And I said, they're so easy. Like, you know, there's watches selling at auction. Now you look at something like the Paul Newman Daytona ended up selling for 17 million. I think there was a Patek Philippe that sold for 30 million earlier this year. So you've got this store of wealth and think about how tiny the watch and how easy it is to store away rather than as I said, like a vintage car and like all the nightmares that come with that. It's such low maintenance. And the thing with fine art is it fine art. It's really hard to get any sort of comparables. It's more based off of like, what will, what will the person pay? Not market comps. Whereas for example, if you get a turbo on Richard mill and you know, they've only ever made 30 pieces of that. I guarantee if you go on Chrono 24 right now, you're going to see a couple of them there and you're going to start to get some market comps. So yeah, that's kind of like an overview of uh, how that works. And the final question is what's the best entry watch for a teenager to start the collection around 5,000 pounds in your opinion? I would definitely say the Rolex Explorer. It's fifth. I think it's right, 
right around like 5,500 or 5,000 pounds, something like that. But definitely no more than that. So Rolex Explorer, because look, steel piece, uh, 39 mil, I believe. Um, and you have a Rolex, like at the end of the day, you have a steel Rolex, you know what I mean? Like you cannot go wrong. That is a watch that will serve you for the rest of your life. And you've got a Rolex, <laughs> right? So I'd say uh, that, and I don't think they're super hard to pick up. Like you shouldn't have a tough time. Like, you know, maybe you might have to wait a couple weeks or a couple months just because it is a steel Rolex. Um, but I don't think it should be, should be super hard uh, to pick one of those up. I don't know, I've never tried or even asked about it. It's, it's not a watch I know much about uh, the demand, etc. So I'd say either that or uh, Omega Speedmaster. That watch is just, honestly, like it's, it genuinely is in so many ways, uh, so beautiful. And in some ways, like I appreciate it just as much, if not even more some in some aspects as the Daytona, obviously I'd still take a Daytona any day, but yeah, I'd say hundred percent Omega Speedmaster. Like that is just, that's also a watch where someone like I would, I would be sat at a restaurant next to someone with a Speedmaster and I'd be like, I'd be like, yo, that's a beautiful Speedmaster. Also, there's so many different variations you can get. It's such a conversation starter, et cetera, et cetera. And it's one of those watches, as I said, where you don't have to spend a lot of money to be kind of quote unquote respected as a, a watch enthusiast, just because that watch is, is such class. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, hope you guys enjoyed this video of me picking up the Rolex Daytona Platinum Ice Blue Dial and also going ahead and answering some of your questions, you know, just sharing what I've learned over the past I mean, it's crazy. It's only been like 18 months of serious collecting. You know, I got my rose gold Royal Oak last May and then that, and that sent things off into a spiral of, of all the Pateks, Rolexes, Richard Mille, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's been 18 months, but it's been a fun journey. So I hope all that has helped. I can't stop looking at my wrist right now. I love this watch so much. And I'll see you guys in the next video.